Well, it's a joy to open God's Word with you again this week. And in continuation of last Sunday, I want us to go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and if you're using a pew Bible, you'll find it on page 1160. I want to begin by reading Ephesians 2 and We'll start again in verse 1. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God, we do come before you this morning marveling at the Savior that Christ is. Singing that song, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lord, as we look at Ephesians chapter 2, as we see who we were apart from Christ, and as now we marvel at your grace in the gospel. Lord, I pray that this passage would uh, stir our affection for you, and that we would find great gratitude and great worship in your grace and salvation. And that because of that truth, we would glorify you in all that we do. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, what makes Christianity unique? What separates the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ from all other religions of the world? Some years ago, during a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what belief, if any, was unique to the Christian faith. They began eliminating what they thought were possibilities. The incarnation, they said, well, other religions had versions of of gods appearing in human form. Resurrection, well, they said, Other religions had accounts of returns from death. And the debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis walked into the meeting. And he asked what the subject was, and they told him. And he said, well, that's easy. It's grace. And he was right. See, the good news of salvation by grace is uniquely Christian. Every other religion teaches you that you can work your way to attain salvation. The Buddhist Eightfold Path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, and the Muslim code of law each teaches that you can attain salvation by works. See, apart from Christianity, apart from salvation by grace, Every other religion teaches that salvation is achieved through human effort and accomplishment. In 2020, a study by the Cultural Research Center revealed that most Americans believe that good works will get them into heaven. 
According to this survey, most people, including professing Christians, believed that they will be saved if they do more good works than bad works. This is religion by works. This is salvation by works. And in contrast to that, the message of Christianity teaches that salvation is all of grace. The religions of the world say you can earn your way to heaven, but the message of the gospel says you must trust in Jesus alone. You see, the sinner saved by grace, as we'll see in these verses, understands that he cannot do anything to contribute to his salvation and therefore places all of his hope and all of his trust in the finished work of Christ. Salvation is not according to what I have done, but what God has done. And in other words, in Christianity, we don't look at our own works, but rather we look at God's grace. And so this morning in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, we will see four gospel reminders that display that salvation is all of God's grace to enhance our gratitude for what we have in Christ and influence how we live. That this this gospel of grace causes us to praise and to worship and to extol God and all the meanwhile causes us to pursue the good works he has prepared for us. And Paul's first reminder that salvation is all of grace is the gracious cause of your salvation. Look at the first part of verse 8. Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now last week we looked at verses 1 through 7, and and you'll remember that in verses 4 to 7, Paul explained God's work of saving us in our sins. And in the middle of this description of the saving work of God, we find in verse 5 Paul's declaration that by grace you have been saved. And then in verse 8, Paul picks up on that thought. And that statement is repeated and explained and expanded. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Here we find in this verse that the divine basis of our salvation, which is God's grace. We are saved, Paul says, by grace. And and what is grace? It is undeserved mercy and unmerited favor. Grace is that unmerited favor from God by which he delivers us from our sins. And I love how one writer explained it. He says, when a person works an eight-hour day and receives a fair day's pay for his time, that is a wage. When a person competes with an opponent and receives a trophy for his performance, that is a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievements, that is an award. But... When a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize, and deserves no award, yet receives such a gift anyway, that is a good picture of God's unmerited favor. This is what we mean when we talk about the grace of God. And not only is God's grace undeserved and unmerited, but notice that it is precisely the opposite of what is deserved and what has been merited. Grace is God's favor granted on those who deserve his wrath. Notice, God's grace is not just undeserved, as if the people whom God saves are are neutral. It's an act of immense favor bestowed on those who lie under God's just condemnation. It's not simply undeserved favor as if we're in some neutral state. Rather, it is God saving sinners 
As we saw last week in verses 1 to 3, God's gracious act of salvation delivered us from the amazing depths of our depravity. Apart from Christ, you lived in trespasses and sins, and what you deserved, what your works merited, was judgment. The wages of sin, Paul says, is death. And in light of this dreary black backdrop is this amazing truth, this amazing diamond that salvation is all of grace. It is only on the basis of God's grace that people are delivered from their desperate situation of sinfulness. You were only saved because of God's grace, Paul says. This truth, dear Christian, should cause us great praise. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. There was nothing that we could do. We deserved God's wrath, and yet God, in his grace, saved us. You're seated in heaven with God, Paul says, because God graciously intervened in your life. He made you alive when you were dead in your sins. The reality is that there are likely some today who have not experienced God's saving grace. And if that's you, I want you to see in this text that salvation is God's free, saving favor despite your sinfulness and despite your deserving of judgment. That no matter the the seriousness or the frequency of your sin, see in this text that God will graciously save the sinner who comes to him through faith. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, he said, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God is merciful and gracious. If you have not received this grace, call out to him today. Receive this gracious offer of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, the wrath of God satisfied, and the amazing grace found in the gospel. This is the amazing grace of God. This is the gracious cause of our salvation, and it should cause us to praise him. Second, Paul moves from the gracious cause of your salvation to second, the instrumental means of your salvation. Salvation is all of grace, Paul says, first, because of the gracious cause of your salvation, but notice second, the instrumental means of your salvation. Salvation is by grace, but Paul also says it is through faith. God's sovereign grace saves us, but that grace is received through faith. It's important to note this because with with the particular emphasis on the sovereignty of God by Paul in Ephesians 1 and 2, a potential danger is for someone to think that there's nothing that they need to do to be saved, that there's no need for the sinner to respond to the gospel, and yet throughout Scripture, sinners are, are called, even commanded, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. You see, while grace is the objective cause of our salvation, the the basis of our salvation, faith is the subjective means by which we are saved. Faith is the means or the instrument through which the believer receives this salvation you could think of it this way. Faith is not the drink. Faith is the straw. 
So faith is the straw in the glass by which water comes into your mouth and satisfies your thirst. Faith is the the means or the instrument by which we are saved. It's what the Lord uses for the sinner to receive this grace. And so if if the gracious gift of salvation is, is through faith, then the question is, is is what is faith and what is the object of our faith? Biblically defined, uh, faith is simply trust or reliance. And while Paul doesn't specify the, the object of our saving faith in this passage, the context of the book of Ephesians and, and the rest of the New Testament make it clear that the object of saving faith is the Lord Jesus Christ and his substitutionary work on our behalf. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul describes Christians as those who have put their hope in Christ. In verse 13, he says they've heard the gospel. They heard the message of salvation that Christ died for their sins, was was buried, and was raised. And they believed in him. They believed in Christ. And likewise, Galatians 2.16 says that salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, the object of saving faith is Jesus Christ. His death, and his burial, and his resurrection on our behalf. Saving faith has typically been described by having three elements. Saving faith is defined as having three elements, which are knowledge, assent, and a, and a confident trust. And one author describes it this way. He says, the mind embraces knowledge, a recognition and understanding of the truth concerning the person and work of Christ. The heart gives assent or a settled confidence and affirmation that Christ's salvation is suitable to one's spiritual need. And the will responds with trust or the personal commitment to and appropriation of Christ as the only hope of eternal salvation. You see, saving faith then is is accepting, resting, trusting, and relying upon Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. It's saying, "I, I trust and I rely on nothing else but the work of Christ on the cross where he paid the penalty of my sin and where he said, it is finished. The work is done. And now, Paul says, salvation is by grace through faith in Christ and his work. But notice here that faith is not merely an intellectual knowledge of facts about Jesus, but it's a confident trust in him for salvation. It's not simply that I know who Jesus is as found in the pages of the Bible. It's not simply enough to say, yes, I believe Jesus lived and died. But it's a confident trust in him. In his commentary on Ephesians, R. Kent Hughes tells of a story of a man named Charles Blondin. Blondin was a French tightrope walker and a world-famous acrobat. Once in London, Blondin played the violin on a tightrope 170 feet off the ground. On another occasion, Blondin took a portable stovetop onto a tightrope and cooked an omelet. If you're going camping this week, I don't recommend that. But his most spectacular feat was crossing the Niagara Falls on a tightrope, 1,000 feet long, 160 feet above the water. And then, 
on top of all of that, Blondin carried a man on his back across the falls. After putting his rider down, he turned to the large crown and asked the man close by, do you believe that I could do this to you? And the man said, of course, I've just seen you do it. Well, in return, Blondin said, well, hop on, I'll carry you across. And to which the man replied, not in your life. Now, to be fair, I wouldn't have got on Blondin's back either. But notice this. Notice that while the man knew that Blondin had successfully carried a man across the falls on his back, he would not trust him to do it with his own life. You see, faith in Jesus is not simply giving an intellectual assent to the truth that Jesus died on a cross. It is to believe in Christ and to entrust yourself to him for the salvation of your soul as the only means of salvation. It's casting yourself on Christ. It's resting in his promises and his finished work on your behalf. So the question is, have you put your faith in Christ? You see, the truth of Ephesians 2.8 is that no one has sins forgiven and no one goes to heaven. No one finds true and lasting peace apart from the saving work of Christ, apart from placing their faith in Christ. The good news of the gospel, the, the message that Paul has here in these 10 verses of Ephesians is that if you put your faith in Christ, you will be saved. The Philippian jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The forgiveness of sins is found in Christ. And this morning, I plead with you, if you have not yet done this, put your faith in Christ. Trust in him and him alone for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul. And more than simply acknowledging that, that Jesus is real, more than simply recognizing the, the facts about him that we learn maybe in Sunday school, Cast yourself upon him. Paul says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And if by faith you have received salvation by grace, then see the assurance that God gives you in this passage. Look at verse 8. Paul says, For by grace you have been saved. Paul here speaks of salvation as complete and the Christian as the one who's enjoying the benefits of that deliverance. Notice that. Christian, your salvation is not merely initiated. Because of God's grace, you have been saved from the just penalty of your sin. And now, your salvation continues in God's safe keeping. Salvation, Paul says, is all of grace, and that should bring us sweet assurance. So we see not only the gracious cause of your salvation, and not only the instrumental means of your salvation, but third, we see in the second half of verse 8, the humbling source of your salvation. Salvation, Paul says, is all of God's grace because it does not come from us, but rather from God. Look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
and this not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. The this in verse 8 refers to the whole previous sentence. In other words, the entire concept of salvation by grace through faith is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Salvation, Paul says, does not originate in you. You're not the source of your own salvation. It is not your own doing. You want to understand the source of your salvation? You want to understand the, the cause of your salvation? Well, Paul says, don't look at yourself. Don't look within you. Rather, look up to God. It is all of his grace. And the implication is that all of the components of salvation originate not from you, not from your human capacity, but from God. And this means that even the act of believing comes from God. That the Christian's response to faith in the gospel does not come from any human source, but is God's gift. And there's a supposed tension there, right? If, gra if the grace of God saves us, but we receive salvation through faith in Christ, do I not contribute faith to my salvation? Isn't faith a, a work that we do to be saved? Paul's answer is a resounding no. He says, this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. You see, faith indeed is our response, but it is not our contribution. Faith is the, the instrument by which we lay hold of Christ, but faith is not a work. Faith is a gift. Notice Paul says in verse 8, it is a gift of God, and that it includes faith. You see, we should never think of our salvation as a transaction, as a two-part work in which God provides grace and we provide faith. No, Paul says it is all of grace. It's given to us by God. But notice also that God does not do the believing for us. We are the ones who are to believe. I think we see this illustrated well in Philippians 1.29. Paul writes this. He says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. It has been granted to you, Paul says, that you should believe in Christ and also suffer for your faith. Those two things have been granted to you. Sinclair Ferguson comments on this passage. I think it's helpful. He says, faith is granted to us just as is suffering. But this gift of suffering means we, not God, experience the suffering. We suffer. In the same way, God gives faith, but he does not do the believing, we do. The gospel calls for a faith response, and that faith is our activity, but it is not in us by nature to believe that faith needs to be affected in us by God. He says in that sense it is a gift. The genius of God's plan of salvation is that he has devised a means by which we are actively engaged in faith and yet contribute nothing to our salvation. It's a free gift to which faith adds nothing. And if salvation is not from us, if salvation is not of us, then what is it? Paul says it is a gift of God. And as a gift, we did nothing to deserve it. It is all of his grace. Grace. 
And furthermore, as a gift, it's nothing that we can earn. Look again at verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Works here refer to acts of obedience. Simply put, Paul is saying that there is absolutely nothing that we can do to catch God's attention or to earn his favor. No human effort, no act of obedience accomplishes anything concerning your salvation. Salvation is not mostly of grace. It is not mostly a gift of God. It is all of grace and entirely a gift of God. So it does not depend on your works, on your baptism, on your prayer, on your obedience. Salvation, Paul says, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This morning, cease trusting in in any source of human effort for your salvation. Instead, simply trust in Christ and him alone. Paul says in Philippians 3 that a Christian is one who puts no confidence in the flesh. Paul says if if there was anyone, if there was anyone who could put confidence in the flesh because of all the good things he had done, it was him. But he says, I put no confidence in the flesh. Salvation is all of grace. And that leads to the fact that if salvation is neither a result of of human initiative, if it's not a reward for good works, then Paul says in verse 9, there can be no grounds for boasting. Look at verse 9. He says it's, it's a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. This is important to get. This is the reason we praise the Lord. You see, because if humans, if we contributed anything to our salvation, that's, that would leave room for us to boast. If you made even the slightest contribution to your salvation, you would at least have some room to boast, right? Right? You would have some reason to take at least a a partial credit alongside God for your salvation. But Paul says it's not a result of works so that no one may boast. And since there is no room for human merit, John Stott writes, there is no room for human boasting either. Salvation by grace alone through faith alone leaves no room for any pride of accomplishment to be expressed before God. There is only one who should receive praise and be exalted for salvation, and that is God. See, we have not worked for it and cannot therefore boast about it ourselves. We did nothing to earn salvation. God, in his grace, sent Christ to live the life we could not live and to die the death that we deserved. That God raised him from the dead and now, Paul says, he has seated us with him in the heavens. And as a result, we ought to praise him. We ought to worship him. We ought to give him adoration for this grace forever. Salvation is all of God's grace. And therefore, all praise and all glory belong to him. You see, the only proper attitude that we derive from these verses, the only possible response for sinful men and women who contribute nothing to their salvation is praise to this God. Believer, since salvation is all of grace, your only pride can be in the cross 
by which you find salvation and the Savior who suffered there on your behalf. I love the words of the hymn writer. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. That, dear Christian, that is our response to this salvation by grace. Nothing in our hands we bring, but simply to Christ we cling. Simply to the cross we cling because it was there that he cried, it is finished, the work is done. And then in verse 10, Paul moves from the gracious cause of your salvation to the instrumental means of your salvation to the humbling source of your salvation to finally, number four, the sovereign purpose of your salvation. The sovereign purpose of your salvation. Look at verse 10. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now the, the four at the beginning of verse 10 is important. It, it connects Paul's logic from verses 8 and 9 to verse 10. And it introduces a, a further reason why salvation is all of grace and has nothing to do with our human effort. Salvation is all of grace, Paul says, because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. God has created us. It's all of his grace. That word workmanship, it's where we get our English word poem, and it refers to something that's been made and was specifically used to speak of a, a work of art or a masterpiece. Something that was carefully created for a specific use. And the only other time that we see this word is in Romans 1.20. And in Romans 1, Paul uses this word to speak of physical creation. But, but now in verse 10, Paul uses this word not to speak of physical creation, but to speak of our spiritual new creation. See what Paul's doing. Paul is saying, while, while all human beings are God's creatures... Specifically, Christians uh, are the ones who are the product of God's new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The ultimate workmanship of God our Kent Hughes wrote, is a human being who, despite being dead in transgressions and sins, has been made alive in Christ. Believer, you are his new creation. And by speaking of, of salvation as a work of God, where he creates us new in Christ, Paul affirms in the strongest possible way that we did nothing to earn our salvation. It's all of his grace. You see, just as the creation of the heavens and the earth was accomplished by God apart from any human intervention, Paul here picks up that logic and says, all who are in Christ are God's spiritual creation. And there was no human work in that creation. And so the 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts the gift, uh, shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God 
in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, this language utterly prevents us from taking any possibility of our works earning salvation. You can be created for work, Paul says. You can be created uh, and then work, Paul says, but you cannot create yourself and then work. Before we can do anything good for the Lord, before we can do any good works for the Lord, he has to do his good work in us. But believer, once he does that, once he does this amazing work of salvation in your heart, then God has given us good works that we are to walk in. And while these good works do not save us, we must not mistake them as unimportant. Paul does not want us to walk away from here and saying, well, if salvation is just by grace, then I don't have to do any work. No. Instead, Paul says that we were specifically created. We were specifically created in Christ Jesus for good works. Notice this. This is so important for how you live each and every day, each and every moment of your life. God created you in Christ Jesus for good works. The the purpose of your salvation, the reason that you have been created in Christ Jesus, the reason that God saved you by his grace is so that you would produce good works that you would walk and live in such a way that you would give glory to God. Do you see this distinction between salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and the role of good works in the believer's life? We, We must not get the cart before the horse. We are saved by grace We did nothing to earn that salvation. But once we have been saved, once God did a work in your life, now you work. We're not saved because of good works, but we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. While good works are not the the root of our salvation, they are the, the fruit of our salvation. This is the Reformation doctrine of sola fide, faith alone. And what those reformers were were known for saying is that faith alone justifies, faith alone saves, but faith that saves can never be alone. So Paul tells Titus that Jesus, Titus 2.14, gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Authentic believers, one author wrote, those made by God's hands work for him. If you are in Christ, you will produce good works. How do we know that? Because verse 10, these good works God has prepared beforehand so that we would Walk in them. Think about this. In other words, in the sovereign plan of God, God planned that you would walk in good works for his glory. Believers, excel still more. This is an amazing reality, and it teaches us that we're not merely to just drift along in the Christian life and hope that our feet land in the steps that God has ordained for us. Nor does it mean that we'll produce uh, good works apart from our own faithfulness to God and his word. No, the scriptures teach both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. You see, you are to pursue good works diligently. Diligently. 
And so use this passage to examine your walk today, to repent of any sinful work that may be happening in your life, and to diligently pursue good work for God's glory. And use this truth, dear believer, to root out any indwelling sin in your life. You know that that habitual sin that you just keep fighting, that just keeps coming back. God created you for good works. Ask yourself, is this thing that I'm about to do, is this thing that I'm about to do that which God created me for? Does it bring him glory? Is this the path that God wants me to walk in? And at the same time, take confidence in God's sovereign plan, knowing that as new creations in Christ, he will conform you and transform you and by his grace enable you to walk in righteousness because he's already prepared those good works for you to walk in. And so John Stott says of this passage, He says, this passage ends as it began with our human walk. Formerly, we walked in trespasses and sins, following the course of the world. We were following the the standards of the world. We were following all that the world would have us to do. We were following Satan, the prince of the power of the air. Our lives, Paul says, were characterized by disobedience. But God, Paul says, but God, because of his grace, because he is rich in mercy, has saved us. And now, because he has saved us, because he has transformed us, because he has created us in Christ Jesus, now we walk, not in trespasses and sins, Now we walk, Paul says, in the good works that God has eternally planned for us. What could possibly have affected such a change? Not any work of ourselves. Stott says it is only this, a new creation by God's grace and by the power of God. What caused you, believer, to go from habitually walking in trespasses and sins to now walking according to the path that he has laid out, according to the directions he gives us in his word? He says it's by grace. It is all of grace, and it is all of his glory. Not that we would boast in ourselves, but that our boast, Paul says, would be in the cross Christ. And so this morning, I want you to use this passage. Today, this week, as you examine, as you meditate on this passage, I want you to use it to examine yourself, to reflect upon your life in light of this passage, to see God's amazing grace in the testimony of your life or to see God's grace for the first time as you see there's nothing that you can do to save yourself. See, Paul says, that salvation is not by good works, but it's for good works. And so if you are here today and you're trying to earn your salvation by good works, recognize these utterly clear words by the Apostle Paul, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That it's all of God's grace, that you cannot save yourself and must cast yourself on the Savior who will save you from your sin. But notice also that while good works are not the basis of our salvation, they do result from salvation. Jesus said in John 15, 8, by this, My Father is glorified 
that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You see, believer, fruit is evidence of salvation. And so if you are here today, this, this should bring up two questions for yourself. One, if you examine your life and see no fruit, then, then ask yourself if you have placed your faith in Christ for salvation. Ask yourself, am I, am I merely acknowledging Christ? Am I just going to church because my friends and my family do it? Am I just saying I'm a Christian because that's what we culturally do? Or have I put my faith in Christ? But then, if you say, I've put my faith in Christ, then rest in the assurance of this salvation, that it is by grace through faith. But then, excel still more. Repent of your sin and follow his word. And dear Christian, may God's grace for you in this passage motivate you to bring him glory in all you do. Recognizing that we are saved by doing, not, not by doing what is right in the sight of God, but we are saved unto with joy and and gladness in the gratitude of God's free grace, all the good works that God has created for us to do. Salvation, then, is all of grace, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the praise and glory of God alone. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, we come before you reflecting on these truths that we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. But Lord, by your grace, we have been saved. We have been rescued from the wrath that we deserve. And now, instead of being sons of disobedience, we are children of God. Father, may these truths cause us to praise and glorify you this week. As we reflect on who we were apart from Christ and we glory in what we have been made by his sovereign grace. And Lord, out of the abundance of praise in our hearts, may we see that we are to glorify you in all that we do not just on Sundays, but, but every day of the week, in, in the mundane, Lord, and in the important, all we are to do is to praise and glorify you, to walk in the works you have prepared beforehand. Lord, may all we do be for your glory, praising you as the God who saves, all because of your amazing grace. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.